Hello everyone, um, fight or flight today. Um, we're going to be combining a lot of what we've looked at so far. Um, and uh, oh, I was going to grab Bella. Bella, come here. All right, fine. Um, we're going to be looking at a lot of what we've looked at so far. Uh, with the nervous system and the endocrine system and how they those two systems combine into a fight or flight res <clears throat> response. Sorry, I've just had loads of honey covered peanuts and they've gone down my throat, which is where they're supposed to go, actually. So <clears throat> fight or flight, you've all heard of, okay? Um, it is an evolutionary innate response to a threat. So it's not something you learn. It's something that is all built into us. It is uh, not known why people go for fight or flight. Um, you know, I, I've had instances before where I've tried to flee, um, where my mirror fell off the wall, and I th and my genuine first thought was that the IRA were coming to bomb me, and I've never moved with such speed in my life. Um, I've also gone into fight mode as well sometimes. Uh, a couple of years ago, a, an old woman uh, double stamped on her brakes at a green light at a major junction. And I noticed in time, but I was maybe a bit too close behind her, and I just went into the back of it. It wasn't, wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. And I, I think I entered fight when I saw it was an old woman and thought, all right, there's 50% chance I could win this. Um and I, I went, ape, I went absolutely ape shit. What she, what she did was really dangerous. I maybe shouldn't have been too close behind her, but what she did was really dangerous. And I, I'm a calm person, but I went full fight mode that that time. Oh, God, I'll, t I'll tell you the story in class, the full story in class, but still really pissed off about it. So, fight or flight, as I said, is a phys physiological response when you experience a threat. Some of you may not actually have experienced this, but I'm interested in your stories about if you have gone into fight or flight. But the point of the whole system is to get the body ready via the nervous and the endocrine system for rapid action to counter the threat. Um, so you kind of do need to know, as this screen goes on about, you do need to know how the sympathetic nervous system actually gets you ready. So I'm going to go through a few examples and you need to be able to know and apply these. The eyes, for example, um, dilate uh, and they let to, why? To let in more light so you can see your threat more clearly. Your digestion, for example, stops because you don't need digestion and therefore that energy can be put to more useful needs in your time of need. Your blood comes away from the skin, which is why when you're scared, you go pale. Uh, the reason that is, is because um, if you're fighting a tiger or a, or a cat, um, you, um, you, and it kind of, gets you if the blood is on the surface you're going to lose a lot of blood and could bleed out but if your blood is away from the surface you may not bleed that much you will release your bowels so you will uh, you know let your bladder go because if you're running away and you're you're carrying a whole bladder of urine with you that's weight you don't need so which is why when you scare people by jumping out on them maybe they may wet themselves there's loads of uh, these examples that you do need to know. Another one, by the way, which is quite interesting, it's on there, is uh, we get tunnel vision. We get tunnel vision. Um, uh, maybe I'll find the video again, but a, a couple of years ago, um, there was this absolutely psychotic cat in my garden, a place I don't live at anymore. This cat was honestly, you'd go near it and it would go and like really like aggressively and then kind of come at you kind of thing. And in the video, it's literally me um, being, the cat follows me into the house, the wind closes the door and traps the cat in the house with me. And I'm being like stalked around my own house. Every time I go towards the cat to try to pick it up, it then absolutely goes mental and tries to scratch me. It's like hissing at me as it's coming towards me. It backed me through the whole of the house. Now during this whole thing, okay, it's quite a tiny threat, but that is a threat. My vision, 
I'm going to put my vision on the threat. Of course you're going to do that. Nobody comes at you with a gun and then you just look away from the gun. Your eyes go to the threat. So what we get is what's called tunnel vision. What we focus on becomes crystal clear. Your vision becomes so much stronger. Um, uh, Bella, come here. Come here. Say hello to everybody. Come on, you fat wobble. Um, come on. Say hello. No? No, say hello. Love me. Um, so if you were scared of cats, for example, there you are, um, and one's running towards you, you would be able to see it with crystal clarity, crystal clarity. Your peripheral vision would get quite uh, poor. Your peripheral vision would get very poor because you're going to focus on the threat and you don't need anything outside of that vision. Uh, so your peripheral vision does actually get very, very poor. I was just demonstrating to you what a cat looks like. So you do need to know a lot of these examples. However, I've just shown you a cat, right? Most of you would not recognize that cat as a threat. Maybe you don't have a phobia, for example. In order for you, and this is a really key point, in order for you to trigger off the fight or flight response, your brain actually has, or rather your hypothalamus, which is part of your brain, actually has to recognize that it is a threat. For example, I could put a picture of a cat up and some of you would see that as a threat because you have phobia. I could put a picture of a clown up most of you would not see that as a threat, but some of you would. And those who see the clown as a threat would have a physiological reaction. And that may get that the evolutionary purpose of that is to maybe get them away from the clown. And thus they're going to survive because clowns are murderers. Everybody knows this. So a good example of this is if your hypothalamus does not recognize the approaching lion as a threat. And you go through loads of things in your head. I'll go through some of them in a minute. Sorry, peanut. Um, then you're going to go towards the line. You're dead. You are dead, right? Whereas you have to recognize it as a threat to be able to get away from it. So the, the key part of the start of fight or flight is that your hypothalamus actually has to recognize it as a threat. I genuinely think if we did a field trip to the, the Congo in Africa, for example, and some of you saw a hippo, I genuinely think some of you would go, oh, that's a cute hippo. Um, not realizing the main thing about hippos is that they are hungry and thus you're going to die because hippos do actually kill quite a lot of people and you didn't recognize it as a threat. You may argue that's evolution, survival of the fittest playing its part. We get that stupidity out of the gene pool. And maybe there's an argument there, I don't know. So hypothalamus needs to kick you off, uh, needs to you know, kick off your ability to recognize a threat. However, in order to do that, you kind of cycle through past memories. So um, most of us have watched, most of her, you know, realize most of us have never actually come face to face with a lion before. So how do we know that it's a threat? We go through our stored memories, our memories of watching David Attenborough's, we go, uh, the documentaries, we go through our schemas, you know, and if I were to get you to open up your schema and look at everything you know about a lion, one of those things would be, it does kill people. They can, they can kill people. So as a lion's walking towards you, you're going, oh shit, hold on a second, there's... There some stored memories, David Attenborough. Oh, yeah, they weren't very nice in David. They weren't very nice in David Attenborough. Lions getting closer. Go for your schema. Now, they do kill people. Oh, shit, I am a person. Uh, that looks quite hungry. <coughs> and so, <coughs> oh, <coughs> peanuts. So, as you go through the, um, <coughs> as you see this line coming towards you, part of what your hypothalamus does is it explores all past memories about this thing coming towards you all schemas that you know, everything you know about it, and then your schema is going to tell this is a threat, and then boom, fight or flight. So that's how your hypothalamus goes through it. Now, there are a couple of different fight or flight pathways. There are a few different ones. <clears throat> you could know the HPA axis uh, SAM pathway, but we're, we're only going to go for the SAM pathway. Uh, those doing a sub 
I would recommend the H- also going through the HPA access. It's a bit, uh, it's a bit more complicated. <clears throat> SAM system is a bit simpler to understand. So, reaction to a threat. Congratulations, you have successfully recognized that this lion walking towards you is a threat. What happens? Your hypothalamus turns to your adrenal gland, sends a message to the adrenal medulla, to the middle part of the uh, adrenal gland, and says, give me all of the adrenaline you have right now. Right, We need it right now. Your adrenal medulla is then going to release adrenaline into the body and you need to know the effects of that adrenaline. Now, you're either going to ready the body for a fight, be able to you know, uh, be able to deliver uh, a, a knockout blow to the threat or you are going to run away if you deem the threat to be more uh, um, have more strength than you. Um, <clears throat> As I said, I think I went into fight mode because I saw in her rear view mirror that it was an old lady driving a car up here, like a head barely above the steering wheel. Um, <clears throat> and I went into full fight mode because I thought I could, I could, I could take her. So as I say, you need to know adrenaline's effect on the body. I would click on that link there if I were you uh, to have a look at the varying different functions of adrenaline. That's a common question, by the way. That's a really, really common question. However... Evolutionary times, that's a a really shit way of saying that. Um, If a lion comes up to you, it's going to be over within half an hour, right? We've evolved on that, right? This is really important to note. We have evolved the fight or flight system to be over within half an hour. You're not fighting lions and hippos as cavemen for three hours. It's it's either you're dead or it's dead. So this is really key. Our whole system is geared towards using high energy strategies within a short space of time. You're going to fight for half an hour. We're going to run for half an hour maximum, by the way. Um, The problem today is that we've conquered all of those half hour threats, mostly and that modern stressors, modern things that stress us out, are actually much, much longer. So, for example, your A-levels. Your A-levels are two years. Two years of stress. You can't maintain the body at that stressful, high energy high energy level for very long. Otherwise, you're going to get ill and you will die. So, the move to a sympathetic nervous system cannot be uh, sustained for long. If your body... When you go... When you go to fight or flight, your body works at an unsustainable level of energy usage. And it can't do that for a long period of time. So the threat needs to be extinguished as much as possible. However, and there's a real key term here. However, it's easy to see that that was useful in olden times, right? And like when we were, when our, our fate was insecure, we were had loads of threats to us, for example. It's easy to see that this fight or flight, five out of five, well done, fantastic system, humans. And well, let's give ourselves a pat on the back. However, today that's become quite, and this is a good term, maladaptive. It no longer fits into society. It no longer works in the society that we've built. So during the run up to your exams, Uh, from about February to March, so February to May, I would say that students do run at an unsustainably high level of stress. Uh, There's no way around that, the the system that we have. Um, So people do, I would say you're more vulnerable. You're more vulnerable to illnesses when you are burning energy as as high as you can during February to May. Um, so this is the sympathomedullary pathway, basically the SAM pathway that we have just looked at. Uh, this is the other route which I mentioned, which I'm not going to go through, but it's definitely worth, especially if you're going for A star, definitely worth knowing both of those. Some of these, oh, sorry, all of these are uh, fight or flight responses. So breathing becomes shallow, your blood pressure increases, pupils dilate, reduces salivary flow. You don't need, you don't need your saliva when you're trying to. Uh, bitch slap a hippo. So, so, some of the sentences I say sometimes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, here's the thing. Um, 
you've entered into fight or flight. You've uh, vanquished the charging hippo, and you're you're, you're there, blood everywhere. I mean, you've got a couple of cuts. Um, you need you need a system to calm down. Imagine if we didn't have that system. If I were to jump out at you and scare you in an alley. No, that's too weird, actually. Um, I don't know. In the classroom. Uh, your heart rate would go up. If you didn't have a system to bring back down again, your heart rate would go up and it would just stay there. So we need the parasympathetic nervous system and we need uh, the, the endocrine system to release GABA to be able to bring that, to be able to calm us down again. Uh, blood pressure decreases, pulse rate slows, digestion starts up again. So once fight or flight is over, the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in with the nervous system. The GABA gets released from the endocrine system, for example. And what you see here is, um, and lastly, I could, um, what's the biggest phobia in in, in uh, UK? Uh, third is snakes, which is ridiculous. Apologies if you have a feeder phobia. Uh, second is spiders. First is public speaking. If I get you at the front by yourself to deliver a presentation to the 23 other people in your class, you would have most of you have a fight or flight response. Now, you know you can't run away because I'm going to have a go at you about that. So you basically, you're not up there looking to fight, but you basically have a fight or flight response, right? Your, your pupils dilate, your, your heart's pacing, you're shallow of breathing, for example. After five minutes, you re- your, 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 your hypothalamus recognizes, oh, there is no threat here. There is no threat here. So it then releases GABA to calm you down. Uh, your parasympathetic system will kick in. And between five and 15 minutes into your presentation, you will suddenly realize, actually, oh, I'm quite calm at the moment. I, I'm calm. My voice is no longer wavering. My breathing is quite normal. I don't look as pale. I, I'm not wetting myself anymore. So <clears throat> uh, that's essentially fight or flight. Now, again, not really that much, not really that much in terms of uh, difficult or extended writing. What I will say is the four bullet points we've done so far in biopsychology, nervous system, endocrine, fight or flight, uh, neurons, that's the easy stuff. That is the easy stuff. So the four we've done, I probably have taught relatively quickly. I could teach this in a week, to be honest with you. The remaining three bullet points are much more complex, much more complex. And they actually do involve AO3. So from the next video, we're going to be looking at lateralization um, and localization of function. A lot more complex. It's going to be a long bullet point, that one. But uh, it's about to get a lot more difficult.